Hey folks, it's Alex Ole here. It has been two years now since I ditched my laptop and desktop. Oh, forgot to push the button. It has been two years now since I ditched my laptop and desktop computers for this iPad Pro. So today I will give you a summary of my experience, what I love, what I hate, and what my final verdict is. I know a lot of people are thinking about making the switch to iPad for various reasons. Every situation is different, everyone's needs are different, but for the longest time I was convinced I could not do without a powerful laptop. I teach four to six university courses per year, both online and offline. I conduct observational field research in various countries, both in cities and off the grid in the wilderness. I travel to conferences internationally, edit documentary video, manage the back end of professional association websites, update my own blog, and now I'm running this little YouTube channel here on the side. I also have a home life, which I use the iPad for Netflix, banking, budgeting, groceries, cooking, do-it-yourself construction projects, family photo management, family videos, the list goes on and on and on and on. But why the iPad? The idea to switch first came to me when I was run commuting. I could have left my laptop at the office overnight, but I often started working on lectures from home at 5 a.m. I would then finish my PowerPoints from the office before 9 a.m. and then teach the lectures immediately after. So I needed my computer at home as well as at the office. I had already downscaled from a 13-inch MacBook Pro weighing 4.5 pounds, that's 2.06 kilograms, to a MacBook Air weighing in at 2.38 pounds or 1.08 kilograms. But in my daily 10K commute, the MacBook Air plus lunchbox, plus a set of fresh clothing, plus a towel and shampoo still weighed more than I really cared for. Enter the iPad Pro at 1.03 pounds or 468 grams. It occurred to me that the people I really admire for their productivity, especially famous authors such as Ernest Hemingway, primarily used a typewriter. He first used a, Cor a Corona 3 typewriter. And after a Parisian cab driver apparently smashed it on the pavement, he switched to an Erica Model 3 portable. When you look at the size of these apparatuses, you see they're ultra-compact reporter models, the kind used by war reporters, which Hemingway had been. Small, light, portable, you whip it out of your bag and get, it, get, get cracking anywhere. At a cafe, on a train, in an airplane, at the office, or in bed. Although Hemingway allegedly complained in a letter to his dad about Corona not being good in bed. I think Erica was better. The simplicity of the typewriter has recently inspired creatives to go back to just typing without the distraction of social media. We can see this in the new FreeWrite models. I love the idea of the FreeWrite Smart Typewriter and FreeWrite Traveler, but I need one device that can do absolutely everything for me. Is a full laptop the only answer? If Hemingway was able to win the hearts and minds of millions around the globe with a device so simple, could I accomplish my tasks with the modern equivalent of an Erica? I figured I'd give it a try. The power of the iPad lies in its screen. The touch screen so responsive, it eliminates an external mouse or trackpad. This shaves 0.22 pounds or 99 grams off your weight. The screen is large enough to accommodate a virtual keyboard, which eliminates the need for an external keyboard, shaving off another 0.51 pounds or 231 grams. When it comes to high precision drawing or handwriting, the iPad can be paired with Apple Pencil weighing in at 0.73 ounces, that's 20.7 grams. This eliminates the need for a Wacom work surface, including its charger. The Apple Pencil second generation charges through a magnetic contact surface, eliminating another charging cable. The charging block for a current MacBook Pro weighs in at 0.93 pounds or 421 grams, not including its power cable. And for the MacBook Air, you're looking at 0.44 pounds, that's 201 grams, not counting the power cord. The iPad Pro charger weighs 0.18 pounds or 81 grams, which includes its cord. Contrary to some early reports, the iPad has a very strong case and sturdy, albeit not unscratchable, glass. For me, this eliminates the need 
for a protective case unless you're going to work in the rain every day. And it saves me another 1.39 pounds or 630 grams. The iPad Pro provides approximately 10 hours of work time with a new battery. And with a simple 2000 mAh battery, which you can get for $50, weighing in at 0.79 pounds or 360 grams, I can boost this to approximately 20 to 30 hours of uninterrupted work time. This may allow me to leave my solar panels their adapters and cables behind altogether. So as a remote off-grid fieldwork office, the iPad wins out hands down. Switching from Microsoft to Apple is a big deal. Switching from an Apple laptop to an iPad is a similarly steep learning curve. It took me months getting used to the differences in workflow. The iPad is essentially a big iPhone with several additional features since iPad OS 13 of 2019. As of now, we are on iPadOS 14.4.2. I already had an iPhone, which helped me transition. But building content-rich PowerPoints with hundreds of stock images every single day, editing extensive video and sound files, working in Excel spreadsheets, online grading portals, and writing and editing thousands of pages of typed text for book manuscripts, journal articles, and peer review came with some major adjustments for me. One thing I absolutely love about the Apple ecosystem is the momentous wireless syncing of files between devices. Having the same operating system between your phone, which for me is also my primary camera, and your editing platform is a dream. I don't need any cables anymore. Still photography, video, and audio files can be dragged and dropped in seconds without switching out any cards, attaching any card readers, or, or lugging around cables. It really is just two naked devices talking to each other constantly as if they were one machine. The iPad also allows me to run my scripts on its own screen as a teleprompter, which aligns a script right next to the forward-facing camera. This eliminates a separate teleprompter, which costs you know anywhere from $100 to $500 and weighs another 0.4 to 6.5 pounds. That's 200 to 3,000 grams. I use PromptSmart Pro, which moves the text based on how fast you read aloud. The app uses the internal microphone to gauge your pace, and it can record both sound and image while it's serving you the text all in one. PromptSmart Pro is just one example of the huge number of very useful at your fingertips apps that seem to be popping up on the App Store all the time, and usually at low cost. Most of these can be downloaded within seconds. That way, you can see if you like them before you buy them. Returning to the on-screen keyboard, I work in three languages, English, German, and Russian. Each have their own alphabets and require their own keyboards. While a physical keyboard is easily switchable to these languages, it cannot have more than two alphabets printed on the keys at one time. So there just isn't enough space. And I don't type blindly in any of these languages. The virtual keyboard switches between any number of languages in no time, showing special characters immediately while also automatically switching your spell checking to that language. I couldn't ask for more. There are a number of software disadvantages. First off, iPadOS does not have floating windows, but only a split screen. You can toggle multiple apps on each side, which is great, and you can easily reverse their order as well. However, text files can get pretty small if you want them side by side. And sometimes a second pa parallel split would be nice on a wider screen to allow for a third document or app to show. There are apps for this in conjunction with an external monitor, but this defeats my purpose for the iPad, which is to remain as minimal as possible. When it comes to professional work, many of your trusty desktop software go-tos don't currently have equally powerful iPad OS versions available. And in some cases, the makers haven't bothered making anything at all for the iPad. Here are some examples from my workflow. I used to heavily rely on Zotero as my citation manager. This open source program is a great help when working in archives and with thousands of text sources that can be sorted, annotated, searched, linked, and plugged into Microsoft Word. But Zotero has nothing for iPad. Its commercial competitor, Mendeley, offers an iPad app, but they really haven't sold me on it yet. I have since reverted to a rudimentary file order structure to save PDFs by theme or by project. This is not nearly as convenient, but it 
is indefinitely transferable between operating systems and computing devices, making it future-proof. Microsoft Word is available for iPad, but it is lim a limited version, and it costs $7 per month and has several irking glitches. For instance, it will close out of the application every time you leave the app for a longer period of time, so between two and three minutes or so, which means you have to find your position in the document after it has reloaded. When working on documents in the cloud, you may also experience latency after several hours of continuous work, which requires a restart. This is time consuming, obviously, and quite annoying. Overall, Word, Microsoft Word, doesn't work as smoothly on iPad as I remember it from my desktop experience. Apple's own Pages app, on the other hand, works like a charm, although it too has limitations, including some latency at times. Of course, none of my colleagues use Pages, and neither do leading publishers in the academic industry, for which reason I have to continue to subscribe to Microsoft Word. Some websites, especially some government portals, do not properly work with iPadOS in my experience. Over the past two years, I've had to use my wife's laptop on occasion to fill official paperwork. This is not convenient. As a university professor, I also have a lot of grading to do. Much of that is entered into Blackboard's online gradebook, which does not scroll properly on iPadOS. Some academic publishers use online editing software in their publication workflow, some of which are not compatible with iPadOS. There are workarounds for all of this. For instance, I can log into my virtual work server, which runs on a Windows platform. There is a slight delay in response when doing this, but remote access allows me to access all restricted features. Luckily, this is rarely necessary. There are some limitations on the iPad when it comes to Zoom, Zoom called specifically. First of all, the number of concurrent Zoom windows on an iPad is, is, is much smaller than it would be on a larger screen. And secondly, when you split the screen to access another application parallel to Zoom, your own video image is turned off automatically. The same is true when you overlay a window. This is annoying. For instance, you're discussing an email with someone over Zoom, and your camera shuts on and off all the time as you navigate to an app and away again. Thirdly, if you are streaming video with sound from your hard drive or from the cloud via Zoom, the volume of the stream file is automatically suppressed. It doesn't totally mute it, but makes it nearly inaudible to your audience. This is a major glitch in my opinion, especially if you're trying to stream pre-recorded conference talks. The same is true if you're running a Zoom meeting parallel to a Facebook live stream. The Facebook live stream will be nearly muted, which makes watch parties impossible. When teaching in a classroom or auditorium, I connect my iPad to the AV system in the room. But since the screen resolution of the projectors and small boards, uh, or smart boards, is smaller than that of the iPad Pro, the projected image never takes up all the real estate available. A workaround is to manually zoom in on the image by manipulating the, the projector lens, but this reduces the overall resolution of the projected image while also distorting the frame ratio causing projection overlap at the top and bottom of the projection screen. In some graphic design apps, such as Pixelmator, the number of editable layers is limited depending on the resolution you choose for a document. This was a first for me. On a MacBook, the tolerance for larger documents is much more forgiving. For instance, if I'm working on a raster-based poster with the size of A1, I'm unable to add any layers. If you have a workaround for this, do let me know in the comments. I don't think this is an issue in vector-based graphics programs. I wish the iPad had a 12 megapixel 4K forward-facing camera with ultra-wide angle lens or moment lens attachment capability. This would allow me to use the iPad as my primary camera for lecture recording when a, a video monitor is essential to make sure your selfie framing is correct. It would be nice to attach a full frame DSLR as webcam. Using a proper camera allows for a shallow depth of field, giving you that bouquet we all so love to see, which the iPhone can't achieve with its tiny sensor. Sadly, iPad does not support direct recording via an external DSL DSLR. Neither does it allow you to tether uh, with the rear-facing camera of your iPhone, which any laptop or desktop will. That is really a loss, especially when you want to select a DSLR or iPhone with wide-angle lens on Zoom calls. Come on, Apple. What's with that compatibility issue?
storage. This is the last thing I will mention. My iPad has 256 gigabytes of solid state hard drive. I often wish I had bought the one terabyte version. Most of the time, 256 gigabytes is just enough for me. But when I have to create more than one 30 minute video or lecture in one day, I run out of local space. Although I exclusively rely on cloud computing, composing a 30 minute lecture can require up to 100 gigabytes of temporary 4K stock video footage. Once the lecture has been ex exported, these files can be erased. But to really make space, I have to tell the cloud to remove working files from my hard drive by disconnecting it from, from the cloud, then reconnecting it. And this will give me all the space I need. But here's the catch. iPad OS, in my experience, needs up to 24 hours to reconnect with all the files in my cloud. With two lectures in a day, I cannot afford to wait that long. OK, so there are many more things to be considered here, but it's been long enough. So after two years of relentless use, do I recommend the iPad? Like I said, it takes some serious commitment. You really need to want it to work for you. If you do, it is possible, and in many ways, very rewarding. As an aspiring minimalist, I feel this is the most logical choice. For me personally, the true value of the iPad is lost when I add a keyboard, a stand, a mouse, an external hard drive, a case, and so on. At, the, at that point, a sturdy ultralight laptop makes better sense to me. But in my minimalist configuration, the iPad rocks like no other device I've ever used. It is, to me, the ultimate professional tool. Always on me, always with me. But then I'm in a very specific profession. My top three reasons for the iPad Pro. One, smallest possible weight. Two, least possible volume. Three, near-perfect collaboration with iPhone slash camera. My top three reasons against the iPad Pro. One, missing key software for iPad OS. Two, split screen and sound limitations on Zoom especially, and three, local and cloud space limitations. A final note, I recently went through an ergonomic workplace assessment. In the report, I was recommended to mount my tablet at eye level and to use a separate keyboard for longer text composition. This would reduce unnecessary strain put on my neck while typing typewriter style. Not sure what Hemingway would have said to that. But I was obedient and got myself a keyboard and a mouse for work, for my work desk. In all other situations, I will stick to my ultra-compact Hemingway setup.